This podcast is hosted by R Double P. If you are easily spooked, creeped, or offended, this might not be the podcast for you. Powering, powering, powering. Hello. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm really good. I'm really good, actually. Thank you for asking. You saw the new Saw movie. I saw the new Saw movie. Saw 10, Saw X. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, for Saw fans out there. And you did invite me, just, you know, mm-hmm. but I was very apprehensive. I was like, uh. If you don't like gore, you're probably not watching Saw anyway. Not for you. If you don't like gore and you don't like – no, and you like and saw – And weird torture. We, yeah, yeah. This one really frames, like, um, why he does it because it's actually a flashback. It takes place between the second and third movie. Oh. So we get John Kramer again. Awesome. Like Fast and the Furious 3. Exactly. That none of us talk about. Why are we all talking Because it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um. If you are a fan of Saw, though, you are going to love this film. I was a bit like, when it started, I was like, mm, I don't know about this. This is taking a while to understand. And then it's like very classic Saw. Very, very classic. And I love Saw, mm. even though I'm like not a massive gore fan. Like, that's not what I reach for. I enjoy it, especially from like a makeup point of view. Mm-hmm. If I get too scared, I'm like, it's just really, really well done makeup. Yeah. It's yeah. just really well done. But uh, my partner, who is also really good with gore, there was one trap in particular that we were both like gagging and looking away. I can't deal. Yeah, it was too much. It was too, like if it, for whoever who's seen it, um, Valentina, Valentina, one of the characters, her trap. Do you want me to explain it? <laughs> yeah, and I'll cut it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like no spoilers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, she has to saw. <laughs> Oh, this wire. But like the traps were just next level in this one. The the creators are insane. Like they have yeah. to be. It was amazing. But um, if you just want to see a really fun, slashy, gory film uh, for Halloween, go see Saw X. Honestly, I gave it an X out of X. It was and so Did good. it give you the uh, impression that there was going to be more or did they wrap up this, the whole series? There's absolutely going to be more. Uh, okay. Like there always is. Yeah. Like this is technically like the 12th or 13th film actually, like including Jigsaw and Spider. Which, Which we don't, don't talk, talk about. about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sorry, Chris Rock. Um, but yeah, it was awesome. And it got me so in the Halloween mood. I'm so excited to watch more slashier films. Cool. So yeah, highly recommend. It was awesome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You got a fact from the freezer? I sure do. Facts from the freezer. Facts from the freezer. <laughs> So, sorry, this is just like a little tidbit fact that I found. So the FBI has struggled to hire hackers because of the FBI hiring rule that the applicants must not have used marijuana during the last three years. Well, they shot themselves in the foot there, didn't, yeah, they? didn't they? We've got to get hackers, but they can't be stoners. Can't be stoners. Ah, how do we do this? Oh, my God. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. I think they're just gonna have to. They're just gonna have to let that one slide. I think eventually they just had to let that one go. They were like, Imagine, like you just know, don't do it while you're in the Pentagon. Like just the silence. <laughs> <laughs> arms crossed, looking at him like, yeah, have you? And they're like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm high right now. <laughs> just don't do it in the Pentagon. We'll be right. I thought it was so funny. <laughs> What's your fact? Okay, so uh, I was reading an article uh, on theveilmagazine.com about 180 kilometres south of Tokyo in Japan in an area of the Pacific Ocean known as the Devil's Sea. Oh, I went there again. There is a small island called Miyakijima and it's part of the volcanic Itsu Islands and it's a volcano that's active on the island and it's called Mount Oyama. It sits right in the middle of the island and people live on this tiny island with this volcano. Oh my God. And it's so active that occasionally it emits sulfuric gas, which is poisonous and it only with a moment's warning. 
So <laughs> the 3,000 residents are required to carry gas masks with them at all times. Oh, my God. Mm. And if you visit the island, you have to do that as well. One, it's given me major lost vibes. Two, how stressful. Yeah. How You're stressful. Like, I wouldn't feel so stressed if I didn't have this volcano next door. Yeah, I'm on a beautiful tropical island, but also... Volcano. Side eye to the giant <laughs> erratic volcano. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my yeah. God. Well, kudos to those people. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be right. She'll be right. (laughs) It's a way of life, isn't it? Hi, creeps and freaks. Creepies and freakies. I'm Michelle. And I'm Courtney. And we are in the nick of crime. We come to you weekly with true crime, some spook spooks, and a little bit of comedy. We focus on being a voice for victims. But we also like to rake the offenders through the coals. We can never really seem to take ourselves too seriously, but we do hope you'll join us. So keep it creepy and stay freaky. And we will see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye. So my sources for today are The Missing Podcast with Many Karudas, who it's a fantastic podcast, uh, Australian Missing Persons Register, 7 News, ABC, 9 News, New Idea, Doe Network, news.com.au, Mirage News, Who Magazine, and uh, the Facebook page, Gordana Katevsky, What Happened to Me. Aha. So as you know, this is a, this is a story I've been wanting to do for a while. Yes. Because Chris told us about this story a few months ago and she said that there was a new sort of push by the family to get more uh, attention on this case. Yes. It, it, it is, well, technically it's an active investigation, uh, but it's been ongoing now for next year. It'll be 30 years. Yeah. So we're going back to 1994. Good music. Yeah. Bad crime year. Yeah. <laughs> Very yes. bad, especially in Australia. Mm-hmm. So it's we're going to New South Wales in the Lake Macquarie region. It's a small suburb called Charlestown. Uh, it's on Awakabal country. Uh, the Charlestown is located just outside of Newcastle in the city of Port Macquarie. It's actually only 10 kilometres away from New, uh, Newcastle. Oh, right. So wow. it's a bayside town. Yeah, yeah. Population is approximately 13,000, uh, and in that town lived a girl named Gordana. Born on 29th of December 1977, Gordana Katevsky was 16 years of age in November of 1994, with curly dark brown hair. Uh, they came from Macedonia. Uh, she's small, she's quite slim. Uh, she's described as vivacious, enthusiastic, and full of laughter. Her parents are Peggy and Bronco. Her 22-year-old sister, her name is Carolina, and she also had at the time a brother named Damien who was 11. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, the family has close ties to the Macedonian community in the area. So on Thursday 24th of November 1994... Gordana went shopping with some friends. The reason she's going shopping is because she's really excited because she's going to her first concert soon. And the concert is Boys to Men. Oh my God. What a special So nice. That's so lovely. So, you know, she's, she's 16. She's going to her first concert. She's not a wild child whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, she's just a good kid. Good, honest girl. Yeah. Going on a fun show. Yeah. She wants to get a couple of things for the show. She wants to buy some stockings, some socks, whatever. Unbeknownst to her, her mum that day has also bought her a nice new top and she's laid it out on her bed to surprise her when she gets home. Oh, isn't that lovely? Now, November in Australia tends to get dark a little later in the evening. Mm -hmm because it's the beginning of summer. So I'm guessing she decided to get home just before it got dark, around dusk. The shopping centre is only a five-minute walk from her auntie's house. Sometime after 8.30pm, she headed out of the shopping centre and walked across the road to Powell Street, which is a tree-lined suburban road with only about 20 houses. And it's it's a cul-de-sac road, so it's like you can't – there's only one way in and one way out. Yeah, no through, no through. Yeah. 
She had to get to her aunt Sonia's house because her mum was going to pick her up after she finished work and take her home to their place in the nearby suburb of Cardiff. Her sister was coming over that night from Sydney with her new baby and her husband. So it was going to be a fun night. Fun, totally normal family night. Walking home from the mall, coming home late to your auntie. It's funny that you say that, totally normal night. Her sister Carolina, 22 at the time, said it was just a normal Thursday night. There you go. We all used to hang out at Charlestown Square. That was the thing that we all did. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary. And she was like, I hung out there when I was in high school. My auntie hung out there when she was in high school. It was very, very regular. Yeah. So as Gordana approached her auntie's house, which I said was just a five-minute walk from the shopping centre, I looked on Google Maps and it's almost like if you're on Powell Street and you're looking towards the shopping centre, you can probably see the shopping centre. Yeah, right, real close. Yeah. yeah five-minute walk, that's... yeah Nothing. Yeah, stone's throw. So a female neighbour, along with a group of young boys skateboarding, saw a white Toyota Hilux, or a similar vehicle, driving down Powell Street and parking on the side of the road. Audrey Barnard was a 67-year-old neighbour who had been recently widowed in 1994. She saw Gordana walking home while she was driving. She said, I was drawn to her because she was so attractive. She had a shopping bag and she was walking with that spring in her step like the world was wonderful. Audrey then passed a Toyota Hilux with what she described as two athletic young men standing behind it. Audrey said, I am certain of the make of vehicle because my husband had only recently died and he had a Toyota Hilux, which he used on our farm. And she said that to the court during an inquest in November of 2002. I saw two figures standing at the rear, she said. They were half turned towards each other and they were moving their arms about in an animated fashion. So the boys with the skateboards that also saw this vehicle, they see Gordana get pulled into the vehicle. They heard a scream and two car doors slamming. And some of the neighbours heard a scream and two car doors slamming as well, which suggests two people. Yes. They go to the nearest, uh, the nearby police station, which is just a block away, to report <laughs> what they'd seen. And sketches are taken of the two men. Now, at the time that they saw this happen, Gordana's aunt, she heard the scream as well. And she came to the front of the house and she saw the white to- Toyota Hilux speeding away. At the time, she didn't realise what was happening. Yeah, of course. She kind of thought, oh... You know, just the hooligans. Yeah. Hoons. Hoons. Carolina called about 9.15 to see where Gordana was. This is about a half hour later. And Sonia said she wasn't sure. Seconds later, Sonia calls Carolina back to tell her they found her wallet and a Grace Brothers shopping bag at the side of the road. The shopping bag had evidently been stretched like it had been in a struggle. Yeah, yeah. She called Gordana's mum and told her she was coming to pick her up as she believed Gordana had been abducted. They started to call hospitals to see if she'd been assaulted and dumped somewhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're thinking best case scenario, maybe someone's picked her up. Yeah. I don't know, maybe beaten her up a little bit and then just chucked her out somewhere. Dumped her somewhere, yeah, yeah. That's that's smart thinking as it well. Is. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Hopefully, they're they're thinking maybe she's hopefully somehow made it to a hospital or a police station, but they couldn't couldn't locate her. Police search animals and volunteers searched for weeks. I mean, we're including horses were sent out, all sorts, uh, with no sign of Gordana. State coroner John Abernethy asked the neighbour Audrey, along with the other witnesses, to undergo forensic hypnosis to try to get... You know, lost memories that they yes. may have had from that night, such as seeing the number plate. Yeah, I was going to say, like, if, if you, you just got, like, some shapes of maybe what the numbers or letters were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe one of them has a tattoo or maybe, yeah. you know, maybe there was, feature. there was red mud on the wheels mm-hmm. or, you know, anything. Something. Anything. Unfortunately, no such memories were uncovered. So... With so little to go on, the police uncovered uh, 
basically no evidence and Gordana has never been seen since. God. Gordana's dad stopped going to work and he dedicated his life to trying to find her. His marriage unfortunately fell apart due to the pressure. The pressure of it. Right. Uh, and he moved to Melbourne where he apparently has boxes of files of uh, from his own personal investigations. Wow. On just a couple of hours sleep every night, he would put together search teams. This is back in the early days when she just first went missing. He'd put together search teams for the Mas- from the Macedonian community and they would go out to look for Gordana and follow leads. And um, he covered the living room in maps and he'd highlight places to track their progress. Wow. He had a whole investigation going. Yeah, dedicated. On occasion, he has been threatened with arrest for trespassing on private properties, once even being threatened with a gun. He also hired a private investigator for six weeks at one point. Wow, yep. He said, I will search and keep searching until I find her. So in the days after Gordana's disappearance, the frantic Katevsky family reached out to any source possible to gain information on Gordana's whereabouts. According to a 2018 article in the Adelaide Advertiser, both Branko, which is Gordana's dad, and Carolina, her sister, consulted psychics on the case, which bizarrely led them both to the same abandoned house in a rural area called Polkabin, which is in the Hunter Valley. Uh, I looked it up on Google Maps. It's about a 45-minute drive away from where yeah. they, the suburb that they live. So they both separately went to psychics? Yes. Whoa. And they both ended up at the same place. That's right. Ooh. So Branco took what was described as an entourage of four-wheel drives to the location, which was given to him by a phone psychic in his home country of Macedonia. Right. The article says... Pulling up to the timber shack, he was about to enter when he heard several cars arriving at the same remote destination. A shocked Mr. Katevsky turned around to see his daughter, Carolina, arriving with her own search party of four-wheel drives. Carolina had independently visited a psychic in Newcastle. Wow, so... The psychics are not even in the same country. Yeah, different countries. And without consulting her father, followed the psychic's directions to the same house. They both went into the house and they felt like they had just walked into a place that had been recently vacated or abandoned. Yeah. Dust Carol- settling. Yeah. Yeah. Carolina said it was just a run-down little shack thing. You know, the old farm shacks, not so much a house, just an old timber-looking thing. Inside, they found something that also seemed to be a strange coincidence. Alongside three wine glasses and some rice crackers was a Madeira cake, which was Gordana's favourite type of cake. What? What? Okay. It's a bit weird. Okay. Carolina and Bronco were convinced that she had just been there days or hours before, and they felt that they had just missed her. They told police what they had found, but oddly, police were not able to lift any fingerprints or any other kind of DNA evidence from the house, which I want to know were the wine glasses washed, like to find no fingerprints whatsoever. It's kind of bizarre. Weird in a whole house. I mean, even if you scrub the house top to bottom, there's always a chance that you've missed, missed like, like on a doorknob or... Maybe they missed that last ring. Maybe print. they missed it. Yeah. Exactly. Mr. Katevsky was, uh, has consulted over 20 psychics, including one in Melbourne who directed him to the same location as the others did. What? So I feel like something did happen in that house. Yeah. Uh, but what, what happened afterwards? Well, who knows? Yeah, where she is now. Yeah. Now, in 1995, the year after Gordana went miss- missing, the family travelled to Bulgaria to consult with the famous prophet Baba Vanga. Wow. Have you heard of Baba Vanga? I haven't. Tell me. So Nikki on the Macabre London podcast yes. talks about Baba Vanga. So she does like a yearly wrap-up of the of weird things that have happened during the year. Oh, and she idea. goes like, what What did Baba Vanga say that was going to happen this year? Oh, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. 
So Baba Vanga was known to make predictions not unlike those of Nostradamus. Right. She is known to have an 85% accuracy record and apparently predicted the rise of Vladimir Putin, the 9-11 attacks and Brexit. Wait, yeah, I think I have heard of this. Yeah. She's like an old lady. She's blind. Yes. Like Bulgaria. Y- yeah. <laughs> Gypsy woman or rather. Gingerbread house yeah, yeah, probably say, lives in a shoe. <laughs> lives in a shoe up on a hill. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's children. <laughs> um, so Baba Vanga um, died the following year at age 85 and she told Gordana's mum Peggy and her aunt Julie that the kidnapper was, quote, known to the family and that Gordana was, quote, still alive but not in good hands. Oh, God. Okay. That's not like... Trafficking? Well, known to the family. I don't know. Yeah. Damn. I don't know. Some more specifics, but like, yeah. Uh, There was a local lady that, uh, that was convinced that a family member of hers was involved somehow. I believe he was investigated, but um, there was no evidence to suggest he had been involved. Apparently, he was a bit obsessed with her. Oh, right. Um, Anyway, and there's another person that was obsessed with her called the Spook. Mm. So there... Uh, there's one person. Yeah, this light just <laughs> keeps on flashing. Flash. I think <laughs> someone's here. Mm. There's one person that the family immediately thought of as a suspect, and that was a man known to Gordana as the Spook. Right. He was something of a creepy guy. One could say a stalker, and he was kind of like a level one stalker, I guess. And she, but it, it was enough to freak her out. Of course. And she was telling family members about him as recently as two weeks before she disappeared. Oh, okay. Carolina said, Gordana said there was this fellow bothering her at work, hanging around and bugging her, and she didn't like him. She didn't know him. I think he was just, I th- she said, I think he just saw her at the deli once and got carried away with her. So Gordana started calling the guy the spook. She would see him at the shopping centre a lot. Yep. Sometimes with friends, they would see him kind of in the distance and she'd be like, quick, go this way. But she decided to quit her job at Woolworths because she just didn't like him Ugh. always popping up and staring at her. Even like light stalking causes especially women to be so uncomfortable. They will literally leave a job. I, yeah. I've felt that. I've right. been there. Like, don't... Uh, yeah. Read the room. Read the fucking room, honestly. So once Gordana spotted him in the line at the deli where she was working and she asked one of the um, other employees to take over and they were like, why? And then they realised, ah, oh, he's here. Oh, I see. So this guy would follow her when she wasn't working too uh, in the shopping centre. Once she was trying on uh, an item at a shop. Yeah. And she came out of the change room to look in the mirror and he walks out of the next change no. room. No. And he looks her up and down and says, that looks nice. And <gasps> then she, she goes, she quickly changes and she just like runs out of the shop. No. So that's not, yeah, that's some full on stalking. Gross. That's gross. That's gross. Harassment. Yeah. Um, but back then in the 90s, it was very much, well, what are you going to do? I haven't committed a crime. I haven't yeah. touched you. I haven't done anything. Take the compliment. Yeah, take the compliment, Ugh. whatever. Ew. So there was another weird thing that happened to the family that they think has something to do with the spook. Mm-hmm. At home, her mum got um, a call from a man claiming to be from a local shop and asking to speak to Gordana. And when Gordana spoke to him on the phone... Um, he started asking her questions like, um, what do you wear swimming and what bra size are you? And again, like a bit harassy and a bit gross and weird. Disgusting. Yuck. The spook was later identified by police and they've confirmed he does not have anything to do with her disappearance. So, look, he was creepy mm-hmm. and he was a creep, <laughs> but he was not Gordana's kidnapper. Not the creeps we're looking for. Yes. Interesting. I'm hoping that after she went missing, he probably went, ooh, maybe I should um, yeah, maybe stop with the creepy stuff. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. And yeah. Maybe I'll um, stop harassing women. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Peggy and her husband Branko established the Gordana Katevsky Trust, uniting with other families of uh, missing children from the area. Thanks to pressure from the group, police set up Strike Force Fenwick in 1998 to investigate the disappearances of 10 young people from the Hunter region who vanished during a 16-year period. In February 2009, police reactivated the investigation as a fingerprint was able to be lifted from the shopping bag she had been carrying on her way home. Shopping bag? Not a whole house? Like... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but that's good. That's great. But no match has ever been found, Ugh. suggesting that the perpetrator does not have a criminal record. Okay, okay. The new suspect. All right. This year, this very year, oh. 2023, oh, shit. Yeah. a new push for information was attempted with podcaster and former police officer Manny Karudas shining a light on the case with his podcast, The Missing Australia, which I highly recommend. Yes, it was a very, very good episode, this one in particular. Um, the whole podcast is fantastic. He does great work. Absolutely, yeah. On the podcast, many revealed that police had been made aware recently by a person that wished to stay anonymous, who had information about the possible identities of Gordana's abductors. Okay. On June 8th of this year, it was revealed that there were two new persons of interest to investigate based on text messages sent to Carolina. Right. The suspects were named by the source to be, quote, capable of despicable acts. Whoa. The source said that on the night of Gordana's disappearance, they had accepted a ride from two men who lived locally and it it was in a vehicle that matched the description of the Toyota Hilux, who, when this person was in the car, they made, quote, a frightening reference to Godana. Okay. They also fit the description of the two police sketches from the time of Godana's disappearance. The source also told Carolina where they lived and previous workplaces. So the source is giving them enough to be interested. Yeah. Like, okay, oh, yeah, you know what else some- can you give us? This yeah. actually sounds like you've got something legitimate to say. Yeah, yeah. It's obvious that this person knows what potentially happened, but they're very scared of these two people. Mm. The well, source also made a statement to Crime Stoppers and sent Carolina a picture of one of the men who Manny Karudas looked at and says there is a strong resemblance between the photo and the two ske- and, and one of the sketches. The source said, quote, Please understand, though, this guy has gotten away with horrific crimes he has committed in the past. If he's identified as a person of interest, I will tell you everything else I know and why I believe him to be responsible. Right. Hey, oh my so God. So there's definitely a chance for more information on the case in the future. Yes. The case is still classified as active. Yes. And I guess now we just wait. What, what are we, four months on? we just got to wait for the police to do their job. Yes. Yeah. Follow every avenue. Oh, my God. They're not going to tell us anything. No. I mean, this is Mushroom Gate. Yeah. You know, they're, <laughs> they're going to stay, they're, they're going to keep very, very quiet on this until they've got something concrete. Especially if they've gotten this information about this guy or guys and that's the description they're using for him and that they've already like gotten away with so much more like they want to keep this like tight and locked it almost strikes me as like um organized crime well you said trafficking before it's very possible like if they've gotten away with things in in the past that that would mean i don't want to say it but maybe a bit of police corruption like maybe the police do know uh, you know, if they've, yeah. if they've committed crimes in the past, the, the fingerprint's going to be on the database. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing with, like, um, actually, I'm pretty sure when you mentioned this case and I was doing, like, a little look up about it, I learned that maybe we've already talked about this as well. Fingerprints in, your, in the system, the police system, mm. sit there. 
Mm -hmm. And it's not like you get a fingerprint from someone and then you cross-reference and the computer does all of it for you. You have to manually cross-reference all of it. It's not like on TV. They just say, like, really... It fast like flips through all the all the possible and then possible match found and then match not, found yeah not like that at all so yeah and, and maybe like they've used new people who don't have a criminal record and like you know there's so many different factors involved but exactly like, so we've just got to wait we've just got to wait Mushroom yeah Gate, 2023 <laughs> what have we learned <laughs> shut up <laughs> shut up be patient because <laughs> those girls from i think my fridge i wanted get it <laughs> Put everything you say out there and pull it apart. <laughs> so a former detective who worked on the case, Bill Glenn, he said he's always believed that the perpetrators were local to the area and knew their way around. So there are questions that have arisen as to whether Gordana's case is related to the unsolved disappearances of several other young women. There are quite a few of them, but namely Robin Hickey, Amanda Robinson and Leanne Goodall. Yes, yes. The girls disappeared just weeks or months apart in 1978 and 1979. So we're talking a good 15-ish years prior. Years prior. But as we know, Mm -hmm. especially with serial killers, they don't just commit one or two murders and then just give up. Sometimes there is, say, for example, with BTK, sometimes they'll have a little hiatus, maybe a little 20 years off, and then they'll come back. Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes they'll have, you know, two years between kills or a few months. Yes. Um, or they'll move direct- locations, whatever. Yeah. But there is a question of is there a serial killer element to yeah. this Is it similar? Case? Is there similar elements? So a, a team called Strike Force Arapaima – was formed to investigate the links between the cases. So I'll just take you through these, these the circumstances of these three girls uh, disappearing. So Leanne Goodall, 20 years of age, was dropped off by her brother at the Muswell Brook train station in New South Wales on December 30, 1978. She was later seen at the Star Hotel in Newcastle. She was due to start a course at Newcastle Technical College in February 1979. So, you know, in about, you know, in about a month, she was, she was going to start tertiary education. Yeah. But after that night, she was never seen or heard from again. The Doe Network states foul play is suspected. Now, the second lady that went missing... I say lady, she's just a baby. Yeah. She's only Young. 18 year, years old, Robin Hickey. She went missing on April 7th, 1979, when she left her family home in Swansea to meet friends at the Belmont Hotel, which is just south of Newcastle. Yeah, close by. Yeah. She had arranged to meet a friend from netball there. Police have described Robin as a known hitchhiker, which it's the 70s. It's the 70s. That's you know, like, who isn't? Coastal Australia, Central Coast, everyone's yeah, hitchhiking. That's what you do. After a few weeks of investigation, the case was dropped as Robin was thought to be a runaway. Yeah, classic. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, if someone had said, oh, she joined a cult. Everyone would, oh, yeah, that, oh, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, you know, Sarah women. did last week. That's normal. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It's what those hysteric women do. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, she's, she's joined, she's left her family, she's left her children, she's in a cult now. No, oh, no, she ran off with a man. No, no, that's what happens. Like, oh, and I just feel like in the 70s and 80s, that was just, I mean, <coughs> teacher's pet. You know, it was just this accepted thing. I know. Why? It, like, <laughs> yeah. So, um, On April 20th, 1979, just two weeks after Robin disappeared, Amanda Robinson, just 14 years old, (sighs) vanished on her way home to Swansea after a school dance. I'm going to go ahead and just presume she hasn't joined a cult. (laughs) Yeah. She got off the bus and was never seen again. After an intensive search, the case went cold and she was filed as a missing person. And it just annoys me that people are just like, oh, they're just a runaway. Let's just 
ditch the case. Yeah, it's don't that worry whole, about it. It's like Gary Adams all over again. Yeah. Oh, you know, he hangs around with stoners. He's just the run away. The assumptions. You know, we don't have to worry about this. We've got bigger things to, to deal with than some teenager acting a fool. I think that's the thing, isn't it? We've got bigger things to deal with. And it's probably like, I think that assumption is definitely laid on thick. But I bet there was people going, but we could do this and we could do this. And they're like, we don't have the time or the money or the resources. And this is why you get people like Bronco Koteski that's yeah. covering their living room wall in investigate, you know, just doing the best he can. Every, every minute of their life. Because he's frustrated. Yeah. I was watching this show on Channel 9 this morning because I'd heard that there was this new missing persons. That light is <laughs> going is nuts. Like, Someone's trying to send us a serious I know, message. I'm gonna, sorry. Yes. Channel 7. <laughs> uh, it was on Channel 9. It's Channel missing 9. persons Australia or something like that. And I was like, oh, cool, you know, great. Awareness. Yeah, you know, creating please. awareness because we want awareness for missing people. Yeah. And I just got the biggest bullshit vibes from it. Like, they're like, oh, on this date, a man found a woman's handbag on the side of the road and he found out it had possessions in it. And they just made it look like we formed a strike force. Yeah, you yeah. know, like a this. missing lady's handbag. Where's the missing lady? And then we we found, you know, evidence that she bought this from this shop and here's the CCTV footage and stuff like that. And it's just like, but, you know, we've got cases and, and it's like, oh, she's been missing for 20 hours now and, you know, the clock yeah. is ticking. Yeah. That, oh, I just oh. don't think it works like that. I really don't. There's not just a bunch of detectives sitting around on their swivel chairs, you know, throwing yeah. a ball against the wall, waiting for a man to find a woman's handbag. Yeah, exactly. It's not like Criminal Minds. It's not NCIS. They're not all standing around making, like, puns. Like, they're just, they're working their asses off. Yeah. And it's... It, so much of it is paperwork. A lot of it's paperwork. So much of it is boring things. And politics. And politics. Yeah. Like, it's it's not like that at all. And it's so... Hmm, when they make these, like, reports and, like, 60 Minutes specials... It's, Shaky camera yeah, running around. Footage was found. Like, shut up. Like... Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I would like to think... You know that you know task forces are are formed every time a dog goes missing. I would, I yeah, really I would, love but that. I just don't think had it works like that. Had the amount of resources. So sorry, Channel Nine. I just yeah. don't think it works like that. Mm. And I I watched it with a very jaded uh, well, lens. Have, doing what we do and reading about this often, it's pretty easy to have a bit of a jaded lens because, like, oh, okay, well, look at all this information I found, like. And you're just wrapping it up in like 20 mm. minutes. I don't think so. I'm sorry I'm not making this episode as fun as I probably like. Maybe <laughs> next week I'll do like a fun, like, you know. Okay, ebbs and flows. Ebbs and flows. 1920s, you know, gangster war or something <laughs> like that we're, that we can laugh about. But this is, I do feel that, you know, there are all these cases. The families are just trying and trying and trying and trying and trying to keep them in the media. And no, no one knows about these important cases. Yeah, exactly. But someone knows something. Well, that's just it. And as you said um, uh, in the, the Ice Cube, like, we need to talk about it more because someone might go, hang on, actually, I saw something. Maybe that would be helpful. As we talked about with Gary Adams, all of that, like, you. <laughs> or, yeah. you know, maybe. I don't know, my boyfriend came that home that night and, you know, there was blood on his shirt and he was really nervous, yeah. like in the Elizabeth Memory case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he said, oh, I bit my tongue. Yeah. And I had no reason not to cool believe Cool story, him. dude. Yeah, exactly. I feel like we're getting really razzed as well because oh. we've got like a strobe light in here right now. I know. Like, do, do, yeah, do. the light is just making it maybe maybe just... We're getting razzed. Someone's here. <laughs> yeah, I think so. They're like, you're onto it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, does anyone know Morse code? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so... In 2001, an inquest named Ivan Malat as a person of interest Whoa. in the three girls' disappearances. That's a big name. Big name. And thinking about the geography of the area, Hunter yeah. Valley. State coroner John Abernethy said, Malat was a person of interest in the investigation and had definite links to the Hunter Valley region in the late 70s while employed as a road worker. Huh. Right. You know, on the road. On the road, moving around. In moving around. 
In getting away quickly from crime scenes. Mm-hmm. However, detectives eventually ruled Malat out as a suspect. Right. So another theory is did these disappearances have anything to do with child abuse rings? Yeah. In late 2021, detectives charged two men who were actually twins over alleged child sexual abuse uncovered as part of inquiries into the disappearances of young women in the Lake Macquarie area in the late 1970s. Okay. As part of ongoing investigations, detectives have been conducting inquiries relating to activity in the East Lake Macquarie area the night Amanda Robinson went missing, Friday 20th of April 1979 including a private fundraiser function at the former Swansea Bowling Club. While exploring this line of inquiry, Strike Force Arapaima detectives uncovered information relating to the sexual abuse of two boys in the late uh, 1980s and early 1990s by two men who were known to them and had previously been arrested back in 2013 for child sexual offences. So I guess these guys might not have anything to do with the girls going missing, but the investigation into the girls' disappearances seems to have uncovered details of another crime going on in the area. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, as we know, child sex offenders, they form communities. Yeah, I don't think there's many people, like, interested in the general area. So, yeah, Yeah. they're finding like-minded, disgusting individuals. But they weren't the only guys that were under suspicion. War, uh, Warren John McCorriston, who was formerly Daydream Island's director of operations, was jailed for eight years and six months for brutally raping and assaulting two women between 1980 and 1997 near Newcastle. What the fuck? Right. He pleaded guilty to five charges relating to attacks on women between 1979 and 1999, hmm. including sexual intercourse without consent and sexual assault inflicting actual body, bodily harm. He was extradited from Queensland to face 28 charges. He was arrested by detectives from Strike Force Arapaima. However, I don't believe he was found to be connected with Gordana or, or any of the other girls' disappearance. So this Strike Force I- I- is getting things done. They're just yeah. not what they thought that they were going to get done. What well, the, the, the initial aim was. Yeah. But, like, but great. 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 Exactly. Well done. Um, so while her body has never been found, a 2003 coronial inquest declared that Gordana was legally dead. According to a 2009 article from the ABC, Gordana's mug- mother, Peggy, says she has nothing but praise for the detectives who have worked ty- tirelessly on her daughter's case. It was around that time that a $100,000 reward for information into her disappearance was announced. Peggy said, the guys that I've been involved with and have been part of the investigation, they they become part of the family and they were quite supportive. But in May 2022, when the New South Wales government and New South Wales police increased the reward money to a million dollars, like they did with Esther's Nan's case, yes. um, she, the way that she reacted was a bit different um, and it suggested that the investigation had just taken a toll on her family. Mm. She said, I'm happy in a way. My opinion would be thank you to the task force at the moment, but it's too little too late. Yeah. To the perpetrators of the crime, Mrs. Katevsky said, oh, uh, she's remarried since, so I'm not sure what her current name is. Mm-hmm. So Peggy said, know that I'll never give up until we get to the bottom of it. My face will be in your face 24-7 until my last breath. Not a day goes by that we don't think about the what-ifs of life. Gordana was young, joyous, innocent, and then she was gone. And that was from her auntie Julie. Gordana was just a teenager when she disappeared almost 28 years ago, unable to live out her life as a result of what we strongly believe is foul play. Lake, Mar- Lake Macquarie Police District Commander Superintendent Steve Kentwell said. There are people out there, perhaps not just in the Lake Macquarie community, but elsewhere in, in, the, in the Hunter, around the state and even the country, who have vital information which could help Strike Force Arapaima detectives. 
We have a dedicated team of detectives continuing to re-examine this investigation and we hope this reward could spark some people's memories from 1994. Anything which, which could ex- assist investigators, please come forward. The announcement was made on International Missing Children's Day, which commemorates missing children who have found their way home, as well as those who have been victims of crime and continuous, continued ep- efforts to find those who are still missing. So if you want to know more about this case, join the Facebook page, which is called Gordana Kotevsky, What Happened to Me? Mm-hmm. If you have any uh, information, of course, call Crime Stoppers, 1-800-333-000, or you can go to their website, crimestoppers.com.au, and you can send a written report online. So don't forget also, Crime Stoppers are not the police. They're a charity that work closely with the police. So you can talk to them anonymously if you want to. Yes. Uh, so that's, the, that's the, the information that we have so far on Gordana's disappearance. So hopefully in the future we will have a little bit more information. Well, yeah, with so many uh, old crimes being – I say old as in like – Historical. You know, historical crimes being solved lately. Mm. Yeah. Hopefully we get some really uh, needed news for, exactly. this, for the family. And look, you know, I mean, it's like uh, Susanna Morphew's remains being found three years after yes. she went missing. Who saw that coming? Yeah, exactly. It can happen. It can happen and it goes to show how long it takes. It's yes. frustrating. Mm. It's so frustrating, not not only for us, but it's this poor family. Mm. Like, yeah, it, it takes time and we can only hope that something comes of this. And yeah. it, it sounds like, it, from this year's update, they're bloody close. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Well, thank you so much for telling us about uh, Gordana's story. Thank you for listening. Sorry. I got heated. No, no. I mean, <laughs> how can you not with information like this? Yeah, I know. No, I know. Well, well needed. Okay. Well, until next time, Fridges, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to follow us on our socials. They're all called I Think My Fridge Is Haunted. That's Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. Yeah, tell us what you think of these episodes so we can talk about what's happening in our little Fridgy community. And there's also still time to vote for the Australian Podcast Awards. Yes, that is right. You have until November to vote for the Listener's Choice Award. Yep. So we're Listener's Choice because we're... Little. <laughs> yes, because there are categories that get selected um, earlier in the year, they have closed. And because, um, yeah, we're a little bit smaller than a lot of podcasts, Yeah, you can vote for us in Listener's Choice Vote. Um, if you just go to the Australian Podcast Awards.com.au, uh, there is a button that says Listener's Choice Award, or go to our link tree on our Instagram, um, pretty sure on Facebook as well. It's The button is straight up the top there, and you just search for our podcast and vote. Um, that is it. We did see the short list of the other podcasts. It was an interesting list, wasn't it? It sure was an interesting list. I know that maybe like our genre is a little bit more niche, but um, no offense to them, but I don't want to lose to the Alpha Blokes podcast. Yeah. And I'm sure they do good work. I don't want to discredit them, but I don't want to lose to them either. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, should we should we talk about that thing? <gasps> the thing. Yes. yes, that everyone should keep a certain date. Just before we go, if anyone um if any fridges are Melbourne based, we're going to be doing a little live afternoon situation. Yeah, live broadcast. A little live broadcast in Frankston. Yes, on the uh, Saturday the 18th of November. Yeah, so um put in four o'clock. 18th of November on a Saturday, put it into your diaries and really soon we're going to give you some more details, more information coming to you live. Although by the time this episode comes out, we might've already put it out. So oh, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's totally new information, yeah. but um, if we have, this is your reminder to yeah. put that thing in your yeah. calendar. It's going to be a really fun little afternoon and yeah. we're we're going to drink coffee and we're going to tell stories. We're going to tell stories and we'd love for you to be there. Yeah. 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 Till next time. Until next time, be creepy. But don't be a creep. <laughs> <laughs>
Bye. Like the spark. Around oh, her it's neck. just flashed. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's hell. It's Christine. She's angry because I hit that button. <laughs> She's like, oh, you think so? <laughs> <laughs>